time for you to go, Prime Minister. Some Conservative MPs want Rishi to pick up his P45 now. Not going to happen, say his friends. In the Red Sea, the Houthis aren't backing off. Nor is Israel. Here at home, a poignant reminder. Lily Ebert, 100 years old, survivor of Auschwitz, on why we cannot and must not forget. Kemi Badenoch is the business and trade secretary who's just pulled the plug on a trade deal with Canada. But she's also favourite to be the next Conservative leader. After talk of plots to unseat Rishi Sunak, would she like the top job? Labour's Jonathan Reynolds would settle for her job. He's the party's shadow business and trade secretary. We'll try to find out what he would do if he did get the keys to that Whitehall office. Colonel Tim Collins is famous for his rousing and inspirational eve of battle speech to soldiers of the British Army in the Iraq War. Now he's running to be an MP in Northern Ireland as the Stormont Assembly remains in gridlock. And 100-year-old Lily Ebert survived the Holocaust and the horrors of Auschwitz, one of those still remaining who did. We had the privilege to speak to her and her great-grandson, Dov, amidst the rise in anti-Semitism here and abroad. Plus, with us throughout the morning, the Conservative commentator and founder of Conservative Home, Tim Montgomery, the executive editor of Politico Europe, Anne McElvoy, and the former Labour advisor and broadcaster, Aisha Hazarika. Welcome to Sunday Morning with Trevor Phillips. A million years ago, I worked for an editor who would often look at a story I proposed and say, but Trevor, will it change the price of cheese? By which he meant, would anyone who wasn't obsessed with politics give a toss? Well, this week, the metaphor became a reality after the government called off trade talks with Canada. The upshot being that British cheese will become more expensive and harder to export. Not great news for our farmers. Add war in the Middle East, conflict in Ukraine, and the prospect of an isolationist United States, and there's reason that cheese is beginning to look like a luxury purchase. Prices aren't coming down all round, and neither is that stubborn 20-point Labour lead over the Tories. The Chancellor's been dropping hints of tax cuts to come, but will that make any difference to the average voter at the next election? Well, we'll find out during the 365 days to go until time runs out for Rishi to hold an election. Or will it be Rishi? Some Tories think that if he could be persuaded to step aside, our first guest could be their salvation. A little earlier, I spoke to the Business and Trade Secretary, Kemi Badenoch. Secretary of State, the government has decided to suspend funding to the UN agency for Palestinian refugees pending an investigation into allegations against some of its employees. Um, who's actually going to do that investigative job? Presumably, you won't trust the UN to investigate itself. Uh, well, I'm not in a position to say. However, it is important for people to understand why we have done this. Uh, there have been very significant allegations made that people from the UN's Relief Works Agency uh, participated or certainly were privy, had privy knowledge to uh, the October 7th attacks. That's extremely serious. And I think it is quite right that we suspend payments uh, to them. Whether the investigation is carried out by a separate arm of the UN or by uh, other, other country governments, I wouldn't be in a position to state, but this is absolutely the right thing to do. Well, whoever does that investigation, how long it takes, uh, this is pretty grim news for two and a half million Gazans, isn't it? Um, how are they going to get food and water while this is going on? 
Uh, so we are funding other organizations like uh, the Red Cross, like UNICEF. So this isn't the UN. This is one particular agency within the UN that had been operating in Gaza. Uh, the UK has uh, been ensuring that we are able to send aid to the people of Gaza. And that's something that we want to continue to do. But there is clearly a problem with the UN Reliefs Works Agency. And that's, it's really important that we do something about that. All right, well, that's all clear. Um, let's, let's move on to something which, at the moment, is a little less clear. Um, did you or did you not sack the post office chair? Uh, yes, we had a conversation and we agreed that it was better that the post office had new leadership going forwards. So, just to, to be clear, that was a sacking, because the statement you've got says, by mutual consent. I mean, you know, when you send your kids to bed and and they go up. It's not by mutual consent, isn't it? It was a sacking. <laughs> it is, it is. Well, with my kids, it is, because they know, they know that if they don't go, then there will be trouble. But uh, certainly, in the case of the post office uh, chairman, it was very sad uh, that we had come to this conclusion. And one of the things I think is important is that when we do need to have a change of personnel, that we don't uh, you know, hound the people or, or go after them. The, the issues that the post, have it, the, the post office has go well beyond the horizon scandal. So this wasn't just about uh, Horizon uh, and the ongoing inquiry into the post office. It's about the post office as an entity uh, and especially the governance of it. Uh, there is a board. There have been disagreements uh, across the board. And my view is that sometimes you just need a different person to deal with different issues. There is a lot more uh, media scrutiny after that ITV drama. I think it is right that we are responsive to that. And so I had a conversation with uh, Mr. Staunton, and we agreed uh, that it would be right that he stepped down. In a way, that makes it even more mysterious. I mean, if it's about a whole series of things, much uh, a wider set of issues than the Horizon question, he's the second board member you sacked. The guy's only been there one year. I mean, what is going on? So it's, it isn't that this is about a series of issues. It's that the post office has a series uh, of problems that it is currently dealing with. Governance is yeah, a critical part But why not give him some that. time to sort those out? Well, because we, he's already had time to sort some of those things out. But you, you appoint people sometimes to take uh, a, a certain type of decision. Given everything that has happened this year, I think we need someone new who can deal with these issues uh, in a different way. I, I, and, I, think you're telling, I think you're telling me that you picked the wrong guy. I didn't appoint him. I didn't appoint him. And at the time that he was okay, appointed... OK, whoever did pick uh, the wrong uh, guy. Uh, uh, Trevor, let me finish. Uh, at the time that he was appointed, we did not have the intense scrutiny that we uh, have now. We hadn't quite started uh, some of the uh, compensation, compensation schemes which are currently ongoing. But if there are difficulties with the board, he's not the only board member, if there are difficulties, then I need to intervene. The wrong thing to do would be to sit back uh, with that bureaucratic indifference that we often see across systems and say, oh, well, well, he's only been there for a year. Let's hope, let's hope things just get better. I see it as my job to intervene if I don't believe that the system is working. And that is exactly what I have done. So it is possible that we will see more people shown the door? Uh, I won't be uh, making any further comments around personnel changes. I think that we need to do this in a civilised way. I don't like doing HR on TV. It is not fair on the individuals. I don't think we should be dragging people's reputations through the mud. Sometimes uh, certain uh, placements don't work out and uh, we've decided to part ways. All right, well, look, just one other thing on, on the board. Um, some of this is to do with the treatment of the sub-postmasters and the way that's been dealt with. Um, do you feel at all ashamed that it took a TV drama to provoke action from a board of directors, about a dozen people, big business hitters, which also included three permanent secretaries, including your own? Do you feel a bit embarrassed that... It was TV that made this action. 
Well, uh, happen. It, w it wasn't TV that made this action happen. In fact, well, I spoke about... Let last, me finish, let me finish, month. let me finish. It, it had been happening. Uh, if you listen to the conference speech, which I gave, I talked about all the things we were doing uh, at the post office. That was in September last year. Kevin Hollenrake, the Postal Affairs Minister, was taking through the compensation bill in December. No, what, what's interesting is that nobody was interested until they watched the ITV drama. Yeah. What the drama, uh, what the drama has done is really bring to life what happened uh, to those postmasters, the horrific experiences that they had. The drama is not okay. what is, has been prompting government right. action. I think it's really important uh, that we stress that. All right, just one quick last question on this. Um, do you expect to see uh, Fujitsu, who uh, were responsible for the system, paying compensa compensation? Uh, I certainly expect that that will happen in due course. I have written a letter to the chairman of Fujitsu. I've uh, asked for meetings. He is based in Japan, so it's not that straightforward. But it is absolutely right that Fujitsu uh, takes part in making sure that all of the postmasters receive a full and fair compensation. Previously, we've been waiting till the end of the inquiry, and it is important that we right. get to okay. the end of that inquiry to know what should, should happen. But Fujitsu okay. is a part of this. They're very much a part of the story. It's not just post office management. And I hope that right. they will do the right thing. All right, let's talk about politics, if we may. It's no secret that um, many Conservative Party members would prefer you to lead them into the next election. In recent days, uh, a couple of MPs have been rather explicit that the party should dump Mr Sunak and install you as leader. Uh, did you put them up to it? A lot of people who are going around doing this are creating uh, problems and difficulties that the party, and more importantly, the country, does not need. I fully support the Prime Minister, and I have said many times that I stood uh, uh, to be leader and lost, and the last time we had a contest, after Liz Truss resigned, I said that the right person to lead the country was Rishi Sunak, and I still believe that to be the case. So what's your message to those people who are going around spreading this stuff? It's this, the same message uh, I gave uh, several months ago when I, I was interviewed by The Spectator, that they need, they need to stop messing around. They need to stop messing around and get behind the leader. The fact of the matter is, most people in the country are not interested in all of this Westminster tittle-tattle. And quite frankly, the people who keep putting my name in there are not my friends. They don't care about me. They, they don't care about my family or what this would entail. They're just stirring. And we have 350 MPs. This is a small number of people who are doing this. The vast majority of Conservative MPs support the Prime Minister, as we saw in the response to uh, the article that Simon Clark put out last week, and I think that should be the end of the matter. Yeah, uh, let me put this to you. I mean, you are one of the leaders of the Conservative Party, and uh, this isn't about necessarily about personalities. It's about the survival of your government. Um, if we look at the polling amongst Conservative Party mem uh, members and activists, you're top of the pops. You have a favourability rating of plus 64%. Mr Sunak is minus 25%. Let's leave aside your own personal feelings about this and loyalty and all that. Surely, as some people are saying, you are the salvation of the Conservative Party and you should be ready to step forward rather than be a shrinking violet. Uh, this, this is not a popularity contest. I'm sure that the website's uh, asking for oh, the, who people... That's what yes, no, is. no, but I'm still answering the question, Trevor. This, this is not a popularity contest. This is about running the country. We have so many issues uh, to deal with, controlling inflation, growing the economy, continuing with the plan that Rishi Sunak has put in place. And quite frankly, we can't just keep treating uh, prime ministers as if they're disposable. Oh, the polls aren't doing so well, so let's toss someone out and find another person. That's quite wrong. The prime ministers are human beings. They deal with a lot. And people like me in the cabinet, members of parliament, and quite frankly, all politicians and uh, the country want to see him survive and do well. We want to see him succeed. We should not be trying to drag out prime ministers on the basis of uh, popularity contests uh, and polling on websites. It's completely wrong and it is not serious. All right, let's talk about your actual serious job, which is as uh, Secretary of State for Trade. Um, this week, you suspended talks with 
Well, Canada, mild-mannered, ma cooperative member of the Commonwealth. What could they possibly have done to offend you that you broke off talks? Well, it's not about personal offence. It's about getting a deal that is right for the British people. Um, and there are two separate things that are going on. One is about the existing uh, FTA, which we do have with Canada, uh, and what has been paused is the new the discussions on the new upgraded talks. I did not think that the offer which they were putting forward was going to be right for agriculture. Uh, in the uh, in the UK, and we still have uh, a second free trade agreement with Canada under the CPTPP. And what I want to make sure is that as we go forward, people can see the benefits of the trade deals we're signing. So this is uh, this is not a not so much a dispute; it is a pause in talks until we can find a way to resolve a specific issue. You know, we were promised uh, the best part of eight years ago that Brexit would allow us to become a global power, particularly a global trading power. We've signed, I think, 70 deals now, but they're pretty much all what they call rollover deals. Uh, it's essentially what we had before uh, when we were in the EU. But there are very few new deals, and some of the ones that we have signed are with small partners like New Zealand, responsible for, I think, two-tenths of 1% of our, our trade. Um, we're not doing very well in signing all the new trade deals, are we? We are doing very well. And that is not, the, that, that is not quite the, the story of what is going on. Yes, we immediately signed uh, about 73 uh, trade deals on leaving. People said that we wouldn't get any of those done and that we were going to go backwards. So we succeeded in that. But, but they we were have all the same new, as they, they were Trevor, before. I need to finish. I need to finish the. I need to finish the, the the answer. Yes, those some of those would have been the same before. But even then, people said that we couldn't do them. But there are some new ones, like uh, the Comprehensive and Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership (CPTPP) is huge. The Indo-Pacific is where global growth is going to be coming from. European growth is shrinking, and we are strengthening our links with those countries on the other side uh, on the other side of the world. And our economy is 70 to 80 percent services. We are not a goods-based okay. economy, and that means that the deals which we sign need to reflect the nature of the UK economy. We have overtaken France in manufacturing. Our economy is growing faster than okay. Germany and France and other EU countries. So it is important for people to know what the facts okay. are rather than focus on a particular day in a particular trade negotiation. All right. Um, the biggest deal that we would want is with the United States. Mr Biden says there won't be a trade deal anytime soon. Uh, Mr Trump, when he was in office, of course, talked about uh, a deal four or five times bigger than what we had at the time. Are you looking forward to a Trump victory? Uh, it, it, it is a shame that the US currently is not signing any free trade agreements with any country. We had gone uh, quite a long way in terms of negotiating a US-UK uh, free trade agreement, uh, as I was made to understand. So we hope that whoever it is who wins the uh, US election, I have no idea who that will be, will be somebody who will look again at the work that had been done and hopefully we pick up where we left off. Oh, well, that sounds like you think Mr Trump might be quite a good opportunity for us. That's not what I said at all. That's not what I said at all. I think, I'm, I actually I'm think it is... the logic of I what just, you're saying. I, I actually think it is very dangerous uh, to speculate uh, on which particular president or prime minister of another country you would like to see. Uh, you look at what's been happening in the Red Sea, you look at the Houthi attacks, we cooperate very closely with the US, and the relationship is between the two countries okay. and the peoples of both countries, not any individual who might be uh, leading at a specific time. Um, can I just ask you, you a bit about, about you? I mean, you're obviously, whether or not you are headed to be leader, you're obviously now a big figure in the Conservative Party. Um, I think it's fair to say that you do divide opinion. Uh, let, let me just play something with which you'll be familiar. You, you spoke recently to a select committee. And you've also made these statements using inflammatory language that likens children and young people coming out as trans to the spread of a disease. I've never said that. That is a lie. Well, that is a lie. And I think you should withdraw that statement. That is a lie. You untrue. just called me a liar. Can I just remind the minister that is unparliamentary? Right. Language it's, what she use. has said is not true. Um, some people would say that was unnecessarily aggressive. Was it necessary? 
it's important that people speak the truth. And if you look at many of the times when I have had significant disagreements, either with other politicians or perhaps journalists, it is always about accuracy and truth. I think it's important. It's important to the country. It's important to your viewers that people know the truth about what's going on. And if you watch that clip again, you can see that that uh, Labour MP was reading something that somebody had sent to her. She didn't know what she was talking about. She was making a, a terrible accusation. And I wasn't going to let my name be maligned. I made sure that people knew that what she said was untrue. All right, well, look, and I make no thing, apology for that. Okay, one last thing. Uh, Mr. Uh, Sir Keir Starmer made a speech last week in which he talked about people stoking culture wars uh, on diversity and inclusion policies. Now, you're Minister for Equalities, and I suspect he was probably talking about you, and he accused Tories of a weird McCarthyism. Um, are you a weird McCarthyite? I, th I think it is a ridiculous, ridiculous assertion. The only people who are stoking culture wars are the people who are trying to change things, the people who are trying to change what's written in our history books, the people who are trying to change what's in our museums. And when someone comes along and says, actually, we think this is fine, we're the ones who are accused of being uh, culture warriors. I don't let myself get distracted by those silly accusations. When people make them, you know that they don't have an argument and so they want to resort to personal attacks. We believe in this country. We think we have a great story to tell. We think we have a great history. Doesn't mean that everything is perfect. But what we're not going to do is stand back and allow people like Labour, uh, like the Labour Party or Keir Starmer to smear our country or our history or even individuals as McCarthyites when what we're okay. doing is standing up for the truth. Secretary of State, thank you very much for your time this morning. Thank you. Let's go straight to our panel. On with us throughout the show today, the Conservative commentator and founder of Conservative Home, Tim Montgomery, the executive editor of Politico Europe and host of the Power Play interview podcast, that's Anne McElvoy, and the former Labour advisor and broadcaster, Aisha Hazarika. Well, Tim, I think we could describe that as combative, <laughs> couldn't we? Um, stop messing around as a message to Tory plotters. Um, will that have any impact? Well, look, the line from her was incredibly clear to you, Trevor. She said, you know, don't, yeah, yeah. <laughs> don't, don't impose this on my family. I don't want this. And um, be loyal to Rishi Sunak. But I think Tory members watching that this morning would have seen someone speaking with clarity, with focus, with grit, and they'd be thinking, hmm, I wouldn't mind Kemi as leader. And the trouble is, her media performances are her real strength. She's very clear in a time when politicians um and uh, and I think there'll be more admirers after interviews like that than before. And that's the trouble, really. Although she professes loyalty, and I'm sure she's genuine, um, well, I'm not entirely sure she's genuine, but I'm 90% sure she's genuine, um, the performance is exactly the kind of performance that Tory members want from their leader. Oh, are we saying there's a sort of meta message here, which is... <laughs> exactly. Uh, the, the big message is, I'm loyal to Rishi, but I'm loyal, look at me, I'm yes. much better. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, listen, we've Absolutely. all been watching The Traitors, OK? <laughs> she's playing the ultimate, like, game here, <laughs> where she's saying, I am right behind Rishi Sunak <laughs> all the way. It's a bit like this week in um, Parliament, uh, Penny Morden almost did, like, a eulogy to, to yeah. Rishi Sunak, and everyone's like, she's running. <laughs> so, I think the more people are kind of professing their uh, loyalty to a a very beleaguered mm. leader when the polls are just tanking and you've got, um, you know, Tory peers being threatened with, you know, losing the whip over commissioning polls against the, the leadership of the Conservative Party. It is hard. I mean, I think I agree with Tim. I think she's a very impressive performer, very punchy, very spirited, very charismatic in many ways. But let's not kid ourselves. You know, this is this is prime time <laughs> moment for people to say, I'm so loyal to Rishi <laughs> Sunak. Such a there cynic is, you are, Aisha. There is a bit of a danger, isn't there? And I think Emmy knows it herself, which is that if you have to keep distancing yourself from people who say, we want you. It's just peaking a bit too early for her. And I think that's one of the reasons, Trevor, as well as the fact that she's probably genuine about the fact that she did. I don't think she necessarily started all this kind of whatever the uh -huh. latest curry house or tea house or oh yeah, <laughs> pub plot of four, four people who had, you know, had a bit too much to drink and then called Conservative Home. <laughs> um, but I think there is something 
problematic for her here, which is if you get picked off at this stage as, and a lot of us are writing this, hey, he is the new face of the Conservative Party, brackets after the Sunak defeat. There's a lot of months in which she needs to calm that down to be able to play her part in the election, show she's a team player, and uh, the old quote about he who wields a dagger doesn't wear the crown, or she in this case, that I think is on her mind and that of those who are really close to it, which you could hear her actually saying in the interview to you, these are not my friends. The implication is there are other friends who are uh, giving better advice. Uh, Aisha, um, let, let's suppose for a moment that there is a Labour government. She would be a formidable opposition leader, wouldn't she? Um, uh, well, I think she, she would be impressive. I think the problem for the Conservative Party after, let's say, Labour does win the election, it depends on the scale of the defeat, right? If the Conservative Party suffers a kind of harrowing defeat and it really, really is reduced, then I think you're not just talking about Kemi, uh, Badenoch or anyone else, you're actually talking about the spectre of reform, really doing a big sort of takeover of the Conservative Party. And that's certainly what people have told me who are in reform. They are basically um, this gunning... This reform, the Farage Party. Yes, absolutely, led by Richard Tice at the moment, but Farage may well come back into the free. So I think it's very difficult to predict which direction the Conservatives are, are going to... It depends on the scale of the defeat. Mm. It depends as well how angry the activists are. I mean, I say this in my own Labour Party experience. When you sh suffer a, a really, really big defeat and the party is in turmoil, it often will go into a comfort zone. The, the Labour Party went more to the sort of far left and I think the Conservative will go more to the far right. I don't think they'll make cool-headed decisions. What do you reckon, Tim? Part of the problem is when the Conservative Party lost big time in 1997, the rump, if you like, of the Parliamentary Party was quite right wing. This time, because of the kind of person that David Cameron selected in the, the A-list, the candidates are much more centrist. And so one of the tensions you could have in the Conservative Party is you have quite a centrist rump Conservative Party left, if there's only sort of 150, 160 MPs, which that poll projected. But the grassroots in the country are actually much more right-wing. And so you could have this collision, really, between what the grassroots want and the parliamentary party, which will sort of just exacerbate the, the tension. But, you know, that point about reform and Nigel Farage coming back, is it going to be next week? Is it going to be after February 15th by-elections? There's some time. It's not going to be never, right? Farage really is. It's just the moment when they choose to put him on the stage. And I think there will be a, a surge. I don't know if Tim and Aisha agree with that. I think, I mean, is quite well positioned to do some sort of deal with reform. If you look at her politics, yeah, she's a kind of politer and in many ways, you know, marginally sort of less yeah, wow out there than, than reform. But I wouldn't think it was impossible for her to deal with Nigel yeah. Farage in a way that would be very difficult for some she, of the she, candidates. She is, she's so, polite. She's a straight talker, though, behind the scenes. I recently uh, did a podcast where I talked about the fact that I didn't know whether any of the leaders, potential leaders, had the intellectual range to be party leader. And I was at a reception recently, I got sort of tapped on okay. the back, oh, and it was, I'm, my name's Kemi, and I'm thick. She sorted my, you out. My, my <laughs> knowledge of, of Kemi is when she was a, a new MP, she rang me and she fessed up to hacking into Harriet Harman's email <laughs> and begged for clemency. Oh, <laughs> so my goodness. <laughs> OK. The <laughs> stories here. Do Do Donald Trump, you've got, <laughs> you've got no problems compared to... Come, come, come on to the uh, substance of the... Some, her actual job, post office scandal. Mm -hmm. so, see, this is not going away. I, I was very struck. She said, I'm not going to do HR on TV, which sounds to me, if I were a member of the post office board, that I should really be making sure that my affairs are in order. Mm -hmm. I mean, she's going to take a, an axe to them, isn't she? I thought this was fascinating. So, this story broke um, yesterday after to noon. Sky broke the, the, the story. And it was interesting because Nobody quite knew what was what was going on. I was actually on air presenting my, my own show and we were trying to sort of dig into this. And then interestingly, the Department for Business could put out a statement to confirm this, but there was very, very scant detail about, they about what to was happening. They disagree, didn't they, about, about what, what the sort of terms were. But just listening to your interview, I thought the, the line that was really interesting is she, she basically said, I'm not going to sit back and just let this, you know, be a lazy sort of bureaucrat. And I think this, even though she said it wasn't the ITV drama, this ITV yeah. drama has it's, shaken of people it has, up. Yeah. We've, it's really yeah. shaken people up. We're, we're going to come back to all of this in a moment, but it is just after nine o'clock. And we are coming up to the top of the hour. You're watching Sunday Morning with Trevor Phillips. In the last hour, the Business and Trade Secretary has said that Conservative MPs plotting to unseat Rishi Sunak should 
stop messing around and they are not her friends. Kemi Badenoch confirmed that the post office chair had been removed and said that it was right that funding had been paused to the UN in Gaza. Well, there's still plenty to come here. We'll hear more from our panel throughout the next hour. Well, we've already heard from Kemi Badenoch, but shortly we'll speak to her Labour counterpart, Shadow Business Secretary Jonathan Reynolds. He was one of the most recognisable faces of the Iraq War and is now running for Parliament in Northern Ireland. The retired British Army Colonel Tim Collins joins me soon. And later we'll hear a stark reminder of the fragility of peace from one of the remaining survivors of the horrors of Auschwitz, Lily Ebert and her great-grandson Dolph. OK, let's turn now to Labour. Here's the man who would like Kemi Bednock to job if they get into power. The Shadow Business and Trade Secretary, Jonathan Reynolds. He joins me now live from central London. Good morning, Mr Reynolds. Good morning, Trevor. Can we just start with um, a party matter? Um, later in the programme, we'll be interviewing the probably the oldest survivor of Auschwitz. He's 100 years old. Says that the world needs to hear that specific story... Is it acceptable, uh, as one of your colleagues, uh, Kate Osmar, has done this weekend, to bracket the Holocaust with the events in Israel and Gaza? Well, no, I don't think that it is. What is happening in, in Gaza is clearly a, a humanitarian catastrophe that is recognised, but there are specific reasons why... The Holocaust is considered as it is. It's important on Holocaust Remembrance Day to remember that. And I understand Kate has apologised. There's been a, a conversation with the Chief Whip. There'll be further conversations next week. But, of course, we take anything in this space extremely seriously. I understand that. Uh, but you, you've been clear. You think it's unacceptable. Will it be a matter for party discipline? Yeah, there'll be those conversations, and I can tell you that they have already been scheduled for uh, the week ahead. Of course, that whenever we have a situation like this, we take it extremely seriously. I think our record on these matters is absolutely clear. I'm always willing to give people a chance to, to give their account of it. You know, it's important that we use something like Holocaust Remembrance Day as a chance to educate some people who do need that. I've, I've encountered that at times as a politician myself, but we will take it seriously. And, of course, there'll be those conversations with the Chief Whip in the week ahead. Can we clear up one other thing about Labour's position? Um, are you actually going to spend £28 billion a year on green projects at any point during the first term of a Labour administration? Oh, Trevor, look, we are committed to public investment that will deliver a much greater amount of private investment. Now, that figure that you've mentioned comes from the overall level of ambition that's been put forward and what is necessary to do the transition in the right way. No, it How much an, you can it spend wasn't an is always determined by the it was economy. A pledge. You were going to spend £28 billion a year. Are you going to do it or not? Yes, but that's where that, Trevor, that's where that figure comes from. How much you can spend is determined by the health of the economy, which is clearly in a challenging position, and our own fiscal rules, which wants to see debt fall by the end of a parliament. So we're still committed to that level of ambition, but we're clear it is the fiscal rules that determine whether you can do that. And that is not because we're limiting our ambition in that space. It's a recognition if you don't have that discipline, you end up with the kind of disaster we saw with Liz Trust, where you're spending more money, but it's on debt interest, rather than the investments that you want to make. We want to see public investment that will grow the economy, see the percentage of, of debt to the size of the economy reduce as a result of that. But our ambition is there, our public commitment is there to that. And we've seen just this week with Port Talbot, what happens when a government doesn't have that ambition? They'll still spend a lot of money, but they'll do it to make thousands of people redundant. That is not acceptable to us. We want more than that. But clearly we, we have rules, we have discipline over how much we can spend. But the ambition absolutely is there. Yeah, well, there are two points uh, that you made in that uh, answer. One is that there is a commitment to £28 billion being spent. And then you said separately there is public investment. Let me ask you a question, the question again. Will there be £28 billion worth of public money, as was promised originally, in green projects? Are you going to depend on the kindness of private sector strangers? Well, hang on a minute. That level of public investment has always been about bringing in a greater degree of private investment to do the transition right, ah, to get okay. 
more private business investment in our economy, you've got to have a degree of public investment. Even this government, Trevor, recognises that. Now, we want to get to that level of ambition by the latter part of the next parliament, but we're clear and transparent that you've got to do that in a way consistent with your own fiscal rules, and the overall health of the economy will do that. You will so, know so, people so are talking BP about doesn't whoever come wins up with the next share. election possibly having the worst inheritance ever. If an oil company doesn't come well, up with this share, you're just going to say, well, it's the private sector's fault. They blame them. No, the health of the economy determines how much public investment you can make. That is just absolutely a fact. People are okay. talking about how challenging whoever wins the next election, the fiscal inheritance might be. But this has always been about improving, frankly, the fact we have the lowest business investment in the G7. That is not good enough for us. We know what is necessary to do that. It's not just public expenditure. But some okay. degree of public investment is going to be necessary to do that. But you can't... Look, and frankly, it's not... Okay. For me, I don't want to be talking about a set figure. I want to talk about green steel or electric All right. uh, vehicle battery factories or warm the, homes. You'll understand the, the, you want to talk about what that will deliver rather than a figure. OK, the, re the reason I'm pressing you about this is that um, right now the Chancellor is talking pretty openly about tax cuts. Um, Rachel Reeves said that she wants to ease the pressure on working people. But it looks like Mr Hunt is planting some landmines for you, isn't he? He's going to... You can't promise to spend uh, expansively, like this £28 because there won't be any money left. And you don't want to say that you will raise taxes uh, because that's always unpopular. They've got you trapped, haven't they? Well, look, I don't think it's so much about planting landmines. It's more a scorched earth policy. I mean, people can see the approach yeah, the of this government. You're going to have to deal with this, really. the last 14 years. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we would like to deal with it if we win the, the trust of the British people to do that. So, yes, the position you inherit always has an impact on what your plans can be. And we won't really know the full picture till we see the last budget of this parliament, which is obviously coming up in a few months. But we are absolutely certain that the Labour platform, which is about changes to the planning system, having real stability through a real industrial strategy, fixing the apprenticeship levy, improving the, the trade deal with the European Union, having a new set of employment rights for people, our new deal for working people. This is an overall platform to attract business investment and give people good jobs and good wages, and we are confident in that, though of course we recognise the inheritance that we get will have some impact on how quickly you can see those real meaningful improvements to living standards that a Labour government will be about. All right, let's suppose Mr Hunt cuts income tax in his budget uh, next month. Will you keep those tax cuts? <clears throat> I've got to see the budget. I can't comment on abstract on things that may or may not happen. I, of course, have well, seen that abstract, already what's he, in the, the future spending takes a, plan. takes a penny off the income tax. Are you going to keep it or not? It's pretty straightforward. No, we have no idea if he'll do that and no idea to, to speculate on that. What is clearly true is that we've seen huge pressures on public services for the legacy of this government, but also what inflation has done to them. And there are real concerns about the sustainability of the government's spending plans as they exist. But you've got to judge a, a budget in, in the round, Trevor, where I cannot possibly make a decision on one thing that may or may not happen at this stage. What I can say is I can look at the record of this government over the time they've been in office. This parliament is the only one in modern history where living standards have retracted. They've got worse. And, of course, the overall picture in the last 14 years has been low growth, because of low productivity, because of low investment, and that is why taxes are high because of that. It's not taxes aren't high because public services are doing well. It's a, it's a measure of the failure of the government that we're in this position. OK, look, I'm sorry to be boring about it because I keep, I guess, asking the same thing. You can't tell me that you'd reverse Tory tax cuts. You can't tell me whether you'd spend £28 billion. Last week, uh, Yvette Cooper wouldn't, spend, wouldn't commit to spending 3% of GDP on uh, defence. What, what exactly is Labour going to be asking the voters to vote for other than the Tory programme with a red rose on it? Well, we can't give you an answer on things that haven't happened. That's why I'm telling you that about your income tax question. The platform we will put forward is building things in Britain again, getting homes and infrastructure built, having more investment in skills through our changes to the apprenticeship levy, having a stronger trade relationship with the European Union, not by reliving anything from Brexit, but by improving the terms of that trade and cooperation agreement, 
getting rid of the other barriers to investment, things like how a business rates system that deters investment or national grid okay. that doesn't deliver that, giving people security in the workplace. We've got a okay. platform around this. We've also got our switch spends, the non-DOM regime uh, being abolished, the changes to private okay. education taxation, which will give us access to dentistry, mental health professionals right. in schools, things that will make a real difference. That's what this will be about. Jonathan Reynolds, thank you very much for your time this morning. Thank you, Trevor. Now back to our panel, Tim Montgomery, Anne McElvoy and Aisha Hazarika. Um, Anne, uh, I think that Labour is mounting a pretty powerful and clearly effective critique of the Conservative government. But uh, do you have a clearer idea than I have of what they would actually do? Well, I think you, you heard it there. They, they want to say we're clearly different, we will not make the same mistakes at the Conservative debate, but when you go through one by one at the moment, all they can say is, well, we can't tell you yet. And I think you can hold out a bit like that, possibly to the March budget, but not much beyond. One thing I thought was really interesting was that £28 billion, which is becoming one of those figures that's beginning to haunt Labour, that commitment on this green technology investment. Now, as I remember it, first, as we know, there was the sort of overall pledge. Then Rachel Reeves, and I think quite rightly, a shadow chancellor, revisited. It, it looked at the, the public finances she's going to inherit and made a commitment to being in the second half of the Labour first term. We don't seem to be hearing that anymore, Trevor. I think it's now turned into if and when the economy allows and we get the private sector money in. So I think a squeeze point for Labour is like, how are you still committed to that pledge about the second half uh, of the first term? That's one example. Labour strategists might say, yeah, see what happens when we go out there with a big pledge and a big figure. It's hung round our, our necks. I think you could feel that Jonathan Reynolds a certain frustration if you, as important as they are, mental health in schools and dentistry. These are their pledges, but, they're, you know, they're not exactly election-winning pledges. And I think they need now to start taking one or two calculated risks about where they really want to be different from the Tories. Yeah, the dentistry is, uh, I think it's 111 million. I mean, these are not huge figures. Um, Aisha, what point uh, do you think they're going to have to change gear a bit? Well, I probably have a slightly different view on this. I think Labour, and we've just actually... Be, last year was the 100th anniversary of the first ever Labour Prime Minister. Last week. Last week. And in, in that time, there's only been six Labour Prime Ministers. We're now potentially going to have our sixth Tory Prime Minister <laughs> since 2010. So, you know, I think we have to be... I think we have to take a step back. I know we're all kind of obsessed about this 20 million, and I sort of agree with that. Maybe Labour were naive to have put such a big figure so early in the cycle. Labour Prime Ministers are as rare as hen's teeth. <laughs> so if I was advising Labour right now, I would say, yeah, it's very boring for people like us to, to not have, you know, the full kit and caboodle out in the sort of shop front. But at the same time, Labour has to play actually quite a defensive game. And if you look at the polls right now, you could argue Labour's actually doing quite a good job. Mm. Because when you look at the polls, and those mm. polls are tested at by-elections, we've had a number of by-elections all across again. the country, yeah. absolutely. Yes, Today point. there's a poll out in the Times newspaper saying that the lead in Scotland is the highest it's been for such a long time. So even though it is boring and frustrating, mm. if Labour does come out with a big shiny new idea, everyone's just going to sort of tear it down. So it is frustrating, I do understand the frustration, but Labour has got one job, and that is to win. That is to win. Uh, uh, Tim, Tim, it, it, uh, they, they, they've sustained, actually, a 20-point lead for more than a year now. So um, people who've been saying, moi, uh, that actually, <laughs> at some point, they're going to have to put forward, uh. put forward something positive, yeah. may be talking out of the back of our necks, really. Well, the, the, I agree with a lot of what Aisha has just said. But Quite right. The, <laughs> too frightened to do otherwise. <laughs> but the danger of being defensive is, you know, voters do have other places to go. You know, there's the Green Party, for example, that's, you know, beginning to do quite well in a number of seats. And if people want something more radical, they could go to the Green Party. They can always, of course, stay at home. And the trouble is that after a while, when every, you know, Labour spokesman comes onto your programme, um, Trevor, and says the Tories are cutting the health service, they're cutting the military, they're cutting the police. And then when you say to them, well, what are you going <laughs> to put... You know, where is the tax, you know, that's mm. going to put this right? And all they ever mention is that famous non-DOM tax. No tax has ever paid for more things in history, I don't think. That's that not true. The mansion tax, I think, people... Oh, yeah, maybe. <laughs> you're maybe right about that. But I think... There are rather fewer <laughs> non-DOMs as well, which they haven't <laughs> yeah. pointed out. You know, a lot of that is, is a bit of a legacy. But thing. Can, I just, can I speak... Yeah. What, what, what There's a point? gap, that's all yeah. I'm yeah. saying. There's a gap look, between the rhetoric and the yeah. tax pledges. And yeah. look, ideally... 
if you love your politics, as we all do, you, you want a party to sort of campaign in, in poetry. Mm. But we also are in a situation where we just had the previous interview with, with Cammy uh, Badenoch. Who knows, there might even be another prime minister before the next election, such is the, the, the febrile nature mm. of the times we're in. And the other thing is, remember, Labour hasn't even been in to see the books. An important development that's happening for your watchers is the access yeah. talks are only going to begin really at the end of this month, beginning mm. of February. By, so by that, the access talks, meaning that Labour's uh, shadow cabinet members get to talk to senior civil servants about what's going uh, What's about what well, might be that's when plans. they start to run out of excuses. Uh, yes, I, 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 I know, love I this do. excuse because it is an excuse because they, they kind of know. I mean, most people who are around and I think a lot we of all experience, know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Probably the viewers know very well. You know, the state of the public finances. I agree that that is a really but, but interesting I think, point. But I think to but be they fair, have to use that. I, once I, I, I do know. I, I think that, but I do think you have to be absolutely realistic. I think any right. Imagine a, a counterfactual. Well, we have Jonathan Reynolds on there. He comes on, he just makes policy up on Trevor's show. Amazing, Trevor's amazing show. Why wouldn't he do that? We'd, <laughs> we'd all be like, what is going on? How naive is this? How can they commit to this? But they're they don't okay, know okay. this. Okay. We haven't had the budget. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. direction of I, travel. So, oh, listen, I don't know why they just can't be honest with me. I'm a, yeah, anyway, <laughs> never mind. Uh, we've got to go to a break. But as we remember the Holocaust, I spoke uh, a couple of days ago to one of the last remaining survivors of the horrors of Auschwitz with a reminder of why a disturbing rise in anti-Semitism means we must never forget. Did you ever think this would happen again to your great-grandchildren? No. I would have not believed that again, that it will happen, but it happened. U.S. correspondent based here in Los Angeles. It's turning everybody into, you know, a crazy, violent drug addict. How are you feeling? I am angry. Legal abortion! It is an anti-woman agenda. Two women say that you paid for their abortions. Are you a hypocrite, sir? Will your candidates win? I hope so. I think they will. I think they're great candidates. I gotta be realistic. My sister's dead. More than four weeks on, there's no murder weapon and no suspect. Are you going to catch this killer? We are doing everything we can. Glenn Maxwell has pleaded not guilty to all six charges against her. Mum, how are you feeling today? Jeffrey said, you answer to Ghislaine. You just don't cross her. I'm so excited. Severe nightmares of these people coming in and just taking me in the middle of the night. I've watched as whole towns were torn apart by natural disaster. I'm alive and I'm thankful for that, but there are a lot of people who aren't. It's not the winds people fear most here, it's the water. We take you to the heart of the stories which shape our world. Do you truly believe what you're saying? A lot of cases that I know are reported from Ukrainian missiles themselves. A ambassador, with respect, I think that's preposterous.
79 years ago, yesterday, the concentration camp at Auschwitz was liberated. It meant that the world would soon discover the utter horror of the Holocaust when six million Jewish people were killed across Europe by the Nazis. The march of time means there aren't many survivors left who can speak about what happened. But this week, I had the privilege to talk to one. Born in Hungary, Lili Ebert survived Auschwitz and this week met the Prime Minister to mark Holocaust Memorial Day. Rishi Sunak said it was a moment he would remember for the rest of his life. Now, a hundred years old, Lili and her great-grandson Dov have shared the truth about what happened in Auschwitz over two million followers on TikTok and have become best-selling authors with their book, Lily's Promise. I started by asking them what that promise was. When I survive, the worst thing in life, being in Auschwitz, that could say was in the life for anybody, the worst thing to survive that, I don't think a lot, a lot, hardly a lot of people survive that. I survived that, and that was terrible. And your promise was that if you survived, you would tell the world. And I did. One of the things that I've seen you talk about is the pendant that you took from your mother. Tell me about that. Tell me about the pendant. The pendant is something very special. That is a thing what survived the worst thing in the world. And that is the only thing what I get left about Auschwitz. You, you were able to keep it because your mother hid it in her shoe. Is that right? Yes, because that is really the un only thing what it is left for my mother to me. What do you think about when you look at it and you think about your mother? Uh, something like that should not any time happen to anybody who to do somebody this terrible thing, the most terrible thing in the world, but without reason to what doing that to anybody. You are now 100 years old. You were in Auschwitz at 20. You promised to tell this story. Some people would say, why does somebody of your age want to work to tell this story? You know, you should be resting. Why do you want to tell the world this story? Because this, this story is so only one normal people would not do something that to another normal people who, who kill anybody, nearly kill without mm. reason. Can I ask you, Lily, you have children, grandchildren, you have a huge family. Do you fear that what happened 80 years ago could ever happen again? That is a very difficult question to answer for me. But we see it can because it happened. It happened to me the second time as well, 
Luckily, they don't, did not kill me. They only nearly. They behaved to, to me, not to whom I mean you should talk to. They, they talk to somebody who is not a normal human being. Why should anybody keep feeling like, feel like that to me when I have not done nothing wrong from the whole world? Dov, the theme for Holocaust Memorial Day this year is fragility of freedom. Why does this still matter? There are people who say we should put this behind us. We sit here today against the backdrop that we know that the anti-Semitism that led to my great grandmother's mother, youngest sister and youngest brother being murdered in the gas chambers of Auschwitz-Birkenau did not die with the liberation of Auschwitz-Birkenau on the 27th of January 1945, but is still ever present in today's world. And that's why it's important to remember, because we need ordinary people like you and I, who stood idly by during the time of the Holocaust, to realise that if we leave hatred to go unchecked, that leads to places like the gas chambers. Auschwitz-Birkenau did not fall from the sky. The Holocaust was not something that was created overnight. This was indoctrination over years of an ideology of hatred. And my great grandmother has gone out to schools, universities, colleges, workplaces, synagogues, churches, mosques for years to share one simple message, which is that we're all part of one human race. And we all hurt when someone cuts us and we all bleed the same colour, red. It doesn't matter what ethnicity, what race or religion you are. And we have to realise that hate only spreads hate, but love will always breed more love. And we have so much more in common than that which divides us. Is that, in essence, um, your point about Holocaust Memorial Day, that actually, let me put it this way, that is a reminder that there's darkness in everybody, that it isn't just a group of people who are particularly bad. I've learned from my great grandmother to focus on the light. So I think there's light in everyone, but unfortunately sometimes people can be, can go down the wrong path and can choose violence and can choose hatred. But yes, it's a choice to choose hatred or love in life. My great grandmother could have so easily come out of the Holocaust and be consumed by hatred and decided to teach her children, grandchildren and great grandchildren, 37 great grandchildren, to be hateful towards Germans or towards people who carried out atrocities towards her, but that's not the case. So again, we have to ask on this Holocaust Memorial Day that people don't allow the plea of never again to be an empty mantra and phrase. We must ensure that it's upheld by action and that wherever you see hatred, particularly now when anti-Semitism is at the biggest rise and percentage that it's been since the time of the Holocaust, that you call it out and you say it's not acceptable, just like I would do when I see any other sorts of hatred, racism, or prejudice towards other people. It is reported, particularly by the Community Security Trust and others, that there is a rise in anti-Semitic behaviour and incidents. Do you think that is right? If you think it's right, why? And what should we do about it? I know it's right because I've faced the gravest anti-Semitic anti attacks that I've ever faced in my life since October 7th. For example? Outside university, there were people screaming that they want an intifada until victory. That means that translates to violence against Jewish people here in the United Kingdom and in the State of Israel. They want violence akin to that which we saw in the Manchester attacks, the London Bridge terror attacks, the 7-7 bombings. That's what an intifada is. And that's what they were calling outside my university, one of the most possibly prestigious universities in London calling for an intifada, violence until victory against the Jewish people. How have we got to a place in the country where anti-Semitism, which once simmered below the surface, has now boiled over and people are very happy for them to show that they're anti-Semitic in the mainstream. They're not scared anymore like they were once upon a time to show that maybe they have this hatred and perhaps they thought that way, but they definitely didn't say that in public. And now what we see is people brazenly and openly in the public without challenge, especially without challenge, unfortunately, from even our police service at times, going out on the streets with placards and with banners and also saying things which are openly anti-Semitic and need to be called out. And it's not acceptable that in 2024, Jewish students like myself, I'll say it again, feel unsafe to wear their kippah on university campus or to be in a lecture 
and feel that they can just learn like everyone else. And I would say the same for any Muslim student who's been facing any increase in Islamophobia, any black student who's been, increased, who's been feeling an increase in racism. We all have a right to learn in freedom. And I would hope that everyone would say the same for Jewish students too. What would you like police or university authorities to do that they're not doing now? The first thing to do is just to listen seriously to what the Jewish people have to say. You know, when Jewish students like myself report anti-Semitism or hatred or people being rude and disrespectful to us, often it comes with questions and context with it. And at times it feels like anti-Semitism isn't taken seriously. We've had great support, thankfully, from the government and the opposition and the police have made amazing statements, but it doesn't often seem that those statements translate into action. So I think we'd just like to see more action being taken against those who in reaction to the worst atrocity against the Jewish people since the Holocaust, have been going out on the streets and calling for further violence and genocide against Jewish people, whether that's here in our country or abroad. And I'll say one final thing about people on social media. If your response, again, to what happened on October 7th is to go out on social media and to comment on my great-grandmother's TikTok page that you want what happened to women on October 7th to happen to my great-grandmother, for her to be raped or murdered or bombed, if that's your response, then your moral compass is completely in the wrong place. And there's a lot of work for us as a country to do to get back to where we were before October 7th, to get back where people are respectful towards one another, but especially against Jewish people. Dov has just been talking about his experience and the anti-Semitic incidents he has faced. Did you think at any time before now that your great-grandson would experience some of what you saw all those years ago in, uh, in Europe? Did you ever think this would happen again to your great-grandchildren? No. I would have not believed that again, that it will happen. But it happened, and when you ask me, I must ask, yes, it can. It can happen again. And it, can ha it, it has happened again. And okay. Savta, what's your message to those who are hateful? Look, look, open your eyes. Ask me why. What is the difference when I think beliefs like that or, or, or like me? Nothing. I believe like normal men people should, that you should be nice to each other and not hateful, but we learned it could happen. And I hope, I hope to God it will not happen again. Remarkable woman. Back at the start of the Iraq War in 2003, Colonel Tim Collins became a household name for his rousing Eva battle speech to the Royal Irish Regiment's 1st Battalion. President Bush hung a copy of it in his office. Now he's running to be the MP for North Down in Northern Ireland. I'll speak to him next.
We go to Iraq to liberate, not to conquer. We will not fly our flags in their country. We are entering Iraq to free a people, and the only flag which will be flown in that ancient land is their own. Show respect for them. The famous words of Colonel Tim Collins to soldiers of the British Army on the eve of the battle he would lead them into against Saddam Hussein in Iraq in 2003. Now he's running to be MP for North Down for the Ulster Unionist Party. We can speak to him now. Good morning, Colonel. Okay, I, I don't know if you can hear me. I can hear you. Okay, good. Um, you've recently been adopted as a parliamentary candidate for the Ulster Unionist Party. Um, you're a military leader. You become a, com a successful businessman. You've written a book. You've made documentary film. Uh, why politics? Well, I was actually approached by the uh, political parties across the board uh, on, from the unionist side to do this. It's not something I came up with um, myself. And having looked at it, um, I thought that actually Northern Ireland is being left behind. The people of Northern Ireland have um, gone without an assembly, which means that the uh, for, for nearly two years now, um, which means that the services and, and more importantly, the, the pay for the carers and the nurses and the, uh, the council workers has lagged behind the rest of the United Kingdom. And it's simply not fair. And moreover, Northern Ireland is not really its voice isn't being heard um, in Westminster sufficiently to um, bring the the benefits of the United Kingdom to the people of Northern Ireland. And for that reason, I, I decided that it's something that uh, I could do something about and I would do something about. Uh, perhaps one of the reasons that uh, the voice of Northern Ireland isn't heard as loudly as it might be, might, might not be to do with Westminster itself, but to do with the fact that the Stormont Assembly uh, hasn't sat for... Ages. Now, we understand the, the Democratic Unionist Party's meeting tomorrow. Uh, we, are, we are led to believe to discuss the question of whether they might uh, move to re-establish power sharing at Stormont. Um, first of all, do you know if that's true? And secondly, if that is the case, do you think that's the right thing? I think um, getting the assembly back up and running is the right thing. Yes, the um, I think Brexit was done on the rush. I think that the the, the protocol wasn't properly thought out. Um, it has um, marginalised Northern Ireland's place in the union, and these are things we need to address. But we also need to have the assembly up and running. And as an illustration of where we've got with that, um, and I, I'm optimistic that the the, uh, the DUP will go back into power sharing, uh, but there's been many false dawns. But um, Sir Geoffrey Donaldson made a, an impassioned speech um, last uh, Wednesday um, in the, the, the House of Commons, and uh, it was widely reported um, in Northern Ireland. It was in every what, what everybody else missed that struck me in the eye is when the cameras zoomed back, the only people in the entire chamber were a couple of sentries on the opposition benches and on the government benches, and the rest was empty, except for a handful of Northern Ireland MPs. That's what the Westminster thinks of us. So we need to change that, and that's something I think we can, I can do. Well, indeed, and uh, it's, it's interesting that uh, you have this faith in politics. Um, many people would say right now that there's if you like, a fall-off in the belief of the public that politics can actually change things, particularly uh, whatever happens at Westminster. What, what makes you think that this is the best way? You've got a big voice, whether you're an MP or not. Well, the, the part of Northern Ireland's issue, in my view, is the um, woeful voting record. Something like, over across the board, something like 60% of people, 59% of people don't vote. And if you don't vote, you get what you get. And so um, one of the things that I'm determined to do is to reach out to the people in particularly North Down, which is somewhere where the wealth creators of Northern Ireland go to sleep at night. And I want to persuade them to come out and vote and have a voice and use their our collective uh, ability to create 
um, better conditions for the, the people in Northern Ireland and also to create uh, jobs that are sustainable, well-paid and uh, meaningful jobs. And when I, I, I was visiting uh, uh, Bangor in Northern Ireland recently and somewhere I knew, knew very well growing up, I'm coming home to, to North Down. But I look at the Queen's Parade, which anywhere else in the country uh, on the seafront of a, a seaside town would be vibrant. It's derelict. Uh, you know, in the mainland and GP, uh, ground is the expensive thing. They've got the ground there. It's it's a bare car park. And the, the regeneration, the money that's needed from that okay. doesn't just come from Northern Ireland. It'll come from America and Europe. OK. Um, you first came to prominence, obviously, as uh, a military leader. Um, the biggest challenge that you might face were you still in the forces today would be what's happening in the eastern border of NATO, uh, Russia. Do you think that we are ready, fit, to pay, play our part in the defence of Europe? We are, in this country, absolutely not ready. Our, our military is a shadow of itself. Our two of our biggest assets, the, um, the two aircraft carriers, are tied up alongside in Portsmouth when we have a crisis in the Red Sea. I think what we have to do is to waken up and realize that the, the battle that the Ukrainians are fighting for their liberty through the illegal invasion from Russia, that every if they do not win that, we're next. And we are, first of all, we're not sufficiently supporting the Ukrainians towards the victory that is essential to us as well as them. And secondly, we're, we're not making any provision for, for the case where they would fail and they collapse and we're next. And we need to be doing both of those things. So we need to up our game in terms of supporting the Ukrainians, that they can find a just peace and liberate their country, every inch of it from Russian occupation. And secondly, we need to be prepared to, to defend ourselves because as Field Marshal Henry Wilson, who also stood as a, as, as, as a candidate in North Down, once said, it's useless having an army big enough to, to invite trouble, but it's not uh, large enough to do anything about it. And, and that's where we're at at the moment. So we're going to have to up our defence spending. At the same time, we're going to have to increase our support for the people of Ukraine, that they can win their victory on our behalf. Uh, there, there's been a bit of talk this week about uh, the possible return of conscription. Um, briefly, can you ever see circumstances in which that might happen? We may have no choice. The uh, recruiting system that the armed forces has has is, is failed miserably. And in reaction to that, the government just keeps renewing the contract. Uh, when I was a commanding officer, I took a battalion over that was 250 undermanned. I threw out another 47 odd undesirables. And I then went out and recruited uh, to full strength within two years. It can be done. But what can't be done is through the current contracts, which have clearly failed. And if we um, can recruit, we'll have to go to conscription. I'd prefer not to, but that's the only alternative. Colonel Collins, thank you very much indeed for your time this morning. Uh, in just a moment, we'll hear once again from our panel. Tells the story of first 20 days of full-scale Russia invasion. And uh, it's told from the perspective of a team of journalists that are stuck in the besieged city of Mariupol and struggling to, to tell the stories of people who are trapped and who are being bombarded indiscriminately, who are dying and just struggling for survival. This boy, his mom was heavily injured and she was taken away and he's looking for her. And then they hear another airplane going over the hospital, so the people start panicking and run back. And uh, suddenly we see <coughs> rescue workers that are carrying Irina, now we know her name, Irina, a pregnant woman, and they carry her in the stretcher. Yeah, this 
became a symbol of, of Mariupol. I think also Mariupol became a symbol of, because it was the beginning of the full scale, it became a symbol of, of what happened to many other cities afterwards. What is happening now to Avdiivka that is almost being surrounded and being bombed. What is happening, what has happened to Bakhmut, to Marinka, what is happening to Kharkiv, my hometown. Two days ago, it was heavily bombed. A child died, dozens of people were injured. So this is not something that over, this is happening right now. It's an illustration and a symbol. We are the part of the community. Also, we are international journalists. So it's like double obligation. And people kept telling us, you have to film this. More like they realize that they have no voice, that they're trapped, no one hears them, no one sees them. More they, when they saw us, kept telling, please, you just have to do this. Because even if they know that journalism cannot save them, you know, we, you cannot stop, stop the bullet at the camera, you cannot stop catastrophic bleeding, but you, ha you can give people a hope that their pain is heard. And that is so important. Every human being on the planet deserves to be heard. Welcome back, and our panel is with me again, Tim Montgomery, Anne McElvoy, and Aisha Hazarika. Aisha, have you got your camo ready for <laughs> when you're conscripted? We were just all looking at each other going, good luck with that. Actually, Tim Montgomery has come in conscription <laughs> sheet. He's actually got his sort of military fatigue trousers. Oh. And it's like kind of... So actually, Tim got the memo. Tim is ready to stand up and fight, as Penny Morden once said. Look, I think... It just feels bizarre. I mean, the idea that, you know, I mean, can you imagine a whole generation of people mm. just going, yeah, put TikTok down, get off, you know, come on. It, it's such a kind of alien concept to us. But underneath it is a very serious matter, which is, I think the point that uh, your previous guest made is really, really important. For a long time, successive governments and successive uh, groups of leaders have thought, don't really need to worry about the military anymore. All of that has changed in the last two years. We are now in a state where our geopolitics has never felt more fragile. And actually, we do have to start having very serious conversations about what we do in the military. I mean, yesterday, the Times was, was reporting that America is considering moving nuclear weapons back to the United Kingdom for yeah, the first time. Yeah, to Lake and Heath in Suffolk. Because of the threats uh, from, from, from Russia. So we are potentially entering a very new period in our geopolitics, which is going to affect our own politics and potentially society. But uh, the, 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 I think that the, the case that's being made by some military people is we, in the media particularly, get all fixated on numbers and the army and all of that when modern warfare mm. is drones, it's cyber warfare, it is uh, psychological operations and all of that, and that actually that's where the money should go. We shouldn't be too bothered about the size of the... Uh, side well, of the armed forces. Well, yeah, you know, the outgoing head of the army obviously begs to differ, didn't he? Had a bit of an argument to Patrick Sanders, who brought this up uh, last week in quite blunt tones. So whether you call it conscription or whether you just talk about what are the ways, all of it, what you say is true, but one, you need people to operate them. Those people are, often need some form of experience, maybe not direct combat experience, but it's not, you know, this is not a war game. This is something that could at any point become real. If you look at the Baltic states and the, the point Tim Collins was making, he said, we will be next. I don't think we, we would be next in that sense, but the Baltic states and the NATO fringe to the east could very well be where we have a forward presence and Britain plays a big role. So you still need more experienced people. And I think conscription seems to be a word that is guaranteed to send everyone ducking for cover. But it is certainly true in Germany that this argument has come back as well. If you can't get people to join the armed forces in whatever 
guys, whether it's to operate drones, but with knowledge, you can't just yeah. you know, get someone who's, who's only done it kind of for fun before. So I think this is the question. Why is the army recruitment failing so badly? That's a question actually the armed forces need to answer yeah. and those responsible for them politically. It takes a very long time to get hired, for instance, if you're at the, I just happen to know family yeah, friend at the and office. Up as well. I think, uh, so the I think army there are is, lots of questions about what's gone wrong. The army is less the problem. If you look like Germany, other landlocked mm. countries in Europe have very substantial armies, we are going to have to share our defence. And Britain's contribution is naval, above all others, particularly in the context of the Red Sea issue at the moment. And the fact is, it's been well advertised now, we have ships that we cannot staff. We can't you know, put enough sailors on. And so I think the, the emphasis, if Britain has a priority, should be rebuilding our, our Royal Navy, because we can't allow America to have to bear, bear all of the burden. And that's where Britain can make the most uh, distinctive contribution. And we have these aircraft carriers, Tim Collins was saying, in, uh, in Plymouth, Portsmouth, and uh, they're not being used at the moment. So well, this uh, yeah, this is the point, that the Americans are... Uh, they, they seem to be getting jittery about our ability to contribute. And one can imagine a President, President Trump, you know, going full tilt on the, Europe's lack of contribution. And fair it. enough. Fair enough. He, he well, I have to burden. say, working a lot in Europe, I mean, Britain, if, you know, if there's anyone still in you know, best in class in some areas, and I agree, with Tim, wholeheartedly about the Navy, but then Chief of the Defence Staff came from the Navy and pro promised Boris Johnson when appointed that his Navy was ready and, and up for any future conflict, which has turned out not to be the case. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't think this is, you know, I think if, if President Trump was, if you like, to go shooting his mouth off uh, at Britain, there are others who you, you might want to, uh, to bring but, into this, notably Germany, but also France, which has a fantastic military capability, works closely with the UK, but is often just off doing slightly different things. We're yeah, yeah. not at all integrated. Well, there's a French tradition and, not to, we don't want to be told what to yeah, do by... Exactly. Well, this <laughs> may be the, the time atmosphere. to revisit mm -hmm. that because of the, the, joint, the, the nature of the threat and size of the threat but from I, Russia I, I do, and beyond. I do think we have to also be honest about the scale of underinvestment in, in our forces at the moment. I was speaking to somebody last week who goes in and does um, a bit of training on these sort of, you know, bases where sort of younger new entrants mm. go yeah. in. And he was saying, if you really go into some of these places and you look at the it's conditions in which they're yeah. living, the, the conditions are so, no. so, so poor. And I know it's expecting sort of five-star luxury, yeah. but the, yeah. the, everything is just so threadbare. Mm. And I think we, if we are serious about this, and I thought the line that was so interesting from your um, contributor was we're big enough to invite trouble, but we're kind mm. of small enough, we're not kind of equipped to sort of deal with it. And that there is a truth there, but of course we have it where we'll, we'll be pitch rolling towards the budget soon. There's so many departments competing for spend right now. The government wants to do tax cuts, ill-advised in, in, in my view, many I may disagree with me. But, you know, all these government departments will be vying. And it does feel over years, defence has always been sort of right down at the bottom of the pecking order. Understandably, health, education. But maybe this time is the time to have <coughs> a difficult conversation and move it higher up. But, it, but these are difficult political choices. Uh, Tim, um... I made the point right at the very beginning of the show that today is the day, 365 days until there has to be an election uh -huh. by law, January 28th, 2025. Um, the Tories are looking at this leader, this 20-point Labour lead, um, and I hear them saying things like, well, yes, but redistribution, boundary redistribution means that we're getting extra seats. They might not do as well in Scotland mm -hmm. as they... There's always political gravity, and that's true, actually. There's always been... Uh, the governing party always gets back some points in the last year. Mm -hmm. um, are the Tories hoping that the Labour lead is soft? Well, they're hoping that. I don't think many believe that it's soft. The pessimism amongst Tory ranks is very deep. And when we had that opinion poll on the front of The Telegraph recently, you know, talking about 160 on Tory MPs perhaps surviving after the next election, I think if Tory MPs could take that now, some would. They are that frightened about the next election, particularly if Nigel Farage enters the fray uh, with reform, in which you turn a defeat into a rout. I think what the Tories need to do, though, is they're not going to turn around their own reputation. The British people who have decided about the Tories, it's returning to those questions you were putting earlier, um, Trevor. What about this 28 billion that you want to spend Labour? Attaching a price tag to Labour, okay. that's the big Tory opportunity, to start damaging Labour rather than reselling the Tories. And Aisha, you've got 10 seconds each. Tories got any chance? Difficult, difficult. Uh, senior... 
cabinet figures say to me, oh, the only thing we can do really is get out of the trenches and really start taking the fight to Labour. I think that's what we'll see coming up. Look, I think it'd be very hard for the Conservatives to, to turn this round, but never forget Labour's amazing ability to lose an election. <laughs> <laughs> OK. That's it for this week's show. I will be back Sunday. Politics Hub with Sophie Ridge on Sky News tomorrow and every night, Monday to Thursday from 7pm. Thanks for being with us. See you next week. This is Sky News Today. It's 10 o'clock, the headlines. Business Secretary says problems with the post office go way beyond the Horizon scandal as Kemi Badenoch tells Sky News she sacked the chairman. Did you or did you not sack the post office chair? Uh, yes, we had a conversation and we agreed that it was better that the post office had new leadership going forwards. The UN chief vows to punish staff involved in the 7th of October Hamas attack on Israel as he pleads for aid agency funding to Gaza to resume. The drive to vaccinate children against measles after a warning from the World Health Organization. And all aboard as the world's largest cruise ship sets sail from Miami. Hello, 
good morning. Business Secretary Kemi Badenoch has told Sky News that the post office needs new leadership a day after she's dismissed its chairman. Henry Salton left his role amid ongoing tensions with the government in the wake of the Horizon IT scandal. Ms. Badenoch.